Good morning. Good afternoon. Whatever it is, I don't know. It's noon. So I'm glad to see everybody here today as we resume our trip through First Samuel. Um, let's see. So well, I think we're kind of all set. I don't have really have anything in the way of announcements. Patty and I are working on maybe some summer plans for us, but you'll find out about those when we might be gone. But for the next while, we're going to be here every Tuesday. Uh, let's see. Working our way through 1 Samuel. So you can tell that we're going to be in 1 Samuel for a while yet, right? Because we're going to go from 1 Samuel right into 2 Samuel. Why? Because they're actually just a one single book. Just artificially divided in two in your Bibles, but they're basically one book, the scroll of Samuel. So... Let's see. Anything you would like to talk about before I open us up with prayer? Don. The guys would like to wish a free Mother's Day to all these lovely guys. Yes, happy Mother's Day. I just saw I just saw the video, the Mother's Day video that's going to run on Sunday morning. So you would really like to be here to see it. So it's really just Joaquin did a great job on it. It's it's about it's, when he, he said it was six minutes long, I went, what? Six minutes? A six-minute video? And then I saw it, and I said, ah, oh, Joaquin, that's a short six-minute video. I've seen long two-minute videos. <laughs> so, <laughs> that's a, so really, because it is coming up on Mother's Day, so we're, that's always exciting at our house, right, honey? Always. Always, yes. Um, our son Robbie is away when he, com he, when he comes back. It's time for dad and son to have a Mother's Day talk. <laughs> okay, so let's see. <laughs> Anything else? Okay, um, I will tell you one thing. So I see that Linda Manners here. And you know that we, have, we prayed for a long time for Linda's sister-in-law, Diana, who was diagnosed with the glioblastoma, and she passed away last week, oh. several days ago. So... I'm um, just, your prayers be with the Manners family and with Diana's family and, um, you know, my response and all that is come Lord Jesus and, uh, you know, the, the promises of God that we await. So, would you pray with me? Gracious Lord, we do lift up to you, Diana, a reminder that this world is broken. We lift up to you the families who were murdered. On Saturday, the world is broken. Um, it shouldn't make a difference that things like what happened at the mall was close to home, but it does. It does. We are all probably just uh, one or two degrees of separation from people who were right in the midst of all of that. And we just pray that... Um, you will bring these families a lot of comfort and, uh, and peace in the days ahead as they grieve, that you would remind us all of where we must go to find true peace, um, strength, joy, and that is in you. You are our shield. You are our rock. There, there is really nowhere else. And just we pray that your spirit will be here with us today as we return to these stories of David um, and just see your work in this world, um, a work that culminated in the death and resurrection of your son, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay, so we are in these stories of David, and um, I will bring out theological points, I guess, as we go along, because it's, it's kind of easy to get lost, and, and enjoy. the stories are so good and so enjoyable, but, but there are things to talk about in the stories, even in these sections, which t they tend not to be, they tend not to draw a lot of commentary for biblical scholars. If you look at a commentary on Samuel, the stories of David running from Saul are just kind of related. Here, well, here's what happened, and here's what happened, and here's what happened. So let's just plunge in. In the 21st chapter, uh, we know that David, the 21st chapter, which we did last week, the beginning of it, David ran to a place called Nob. 
And this map, which I had last week, um, is a real good, handy little map. It's got most of the places depicted on it. Nob is very close to um, Jebus, which will become Jerusalem once David conquers it, which hasn't happened yet, okay? And um, uh, David goes there for help. And the priest to him elect, though he's nervous about this, does. And in the end, gives him bread. Remember, like the day old bread from the um, table of the presence in the tabernacle? Gives him this bread. And then David presumably takes that back to his hungry men, and that's all good. But in the midst of all of that, there was somebody there named Doeg, who is an Edomite. And that's a name we need to remember. So just, just file that away, okay? So let's just plunge in. So, 21 verse 10. What, what's coming up is David's trying to escape from Saul and stay away from the Saul's clutches, all right? So, that day David fled from Saul and went to Achish, king of Gath. So, um, there you see the city of Gath in, we, uh, you know, on the western side of that spine, that is a Philistine city. So it has a Philistine king, and that Philistine king is named Achish. There are five Philistine cities that are prominent in these sections of Scripture, and Gath is one of them. So David is basically running to what has been the enemy of Israel for a long time. It is a Philistine that David slew when he slew Goliath. And he's got Goliath's sword with him. Do you remember that from last week? That's, he got that from the priest Ahimelech in Nob. And now he's gone to Gath. He is looking for protection, really. But the servants of Achish said to the king, Isn't this David, the king of the land? Well, isn't that interesting? Isn't that interesting? Who is the... Who is the king of the land, actually? Right. Is David king? Well, kind of, yeah. I mean, God anointed him king. He's king already and not yet, Patty says. Yes, he's king already and not yet. Right? He, he, he's not going to become... He's not going to become more king when he's crowned by the tribes many chapters away. He's already king, truly, in God's eyes. It's just that everybody doesn't know it yet. But the Philistines seem to sense it. It's one of those signposts. They see David as the king of the land, even though Saul is still sitting on the throne. Yes, Jim? He would probably be also be very famous among the Philistines because of what he did. To very famous. You're right, Jim. Well known. He's... Saul killed his thousands, and David killed his tens of thousands, and David led the men out. And remember, he had to collect he caught four, 100 foreskins, Philistine foreskins, as a marriage, as a bride payment, and came home with 200 of them. Yes, all those stories, you see? So that would make you pretty well known. Maybe, maybe infamous is the, is the right word, right? Infamous. But certainly the kind of things that would lead people to see David as king in a way that his own, um, that the tribes of Israel do not. Because Saul is obviously reigning right in their midst. And so they say, isn't this David the king of the land? Isn't he the one they sing about in their dances? Saul is slain as thousands and David is tens of thousands. Well, hmm, this isn't good for David. So what does he do? David took the words to heart and was very much afraid of Achish, king of Gath. It's sort of like the little dog that's caught the car, right? Yeah, now he's in Gath. The king is there. This isn't going well. What do I do? What do I do? What do I do? So here's what David decides to do. So he pretended to be insane in their presence. <laughs> to be insane. And while he was in their hands, he acted like a madman, making marks on the doors of the gate and letting saliva run down his beard, right? So he's just kind of running around like he's just crazy, crazy, crazy. <laughs> that's, that's the stratagem. 
Patty and I, I, there was a show that was once on called King of Queens. And it's on at night a lot. And sometimes Patty and I will drop in on an episode or see a bits and pieces. But there's one episode where, where, where Doug can't remember people's names. And he's so nervous about meeting the, his wife's, you know, co-workers and trying to come up with names that and he finally can't and he's caught and he's trying to feel what do i do now i can't remember her name what do i do what do i and so he just fakes a heart attack drops on the floor <laughs> that's it fakes a heart attack well david does not fake a heart attack instead he pretends to be insane in their presence so all right i guess he did a really good job at faking insanity so Akish said to his servants look at the man he's insane why bring him to me? Am I so short of madmen that you have to bring this fellow here to carry on like this in front of me? I got plenty with all you guys out there. I don't need another madman. <laughs> Must this man come into my house? Oh, wow. You can just picture it. <laughs> At David. So, verse 22, verse 1. So David left Gath and escaped to the cave of Adullam, right there. So he left Gath, now he heads eastward to Adullam, which is kind of right there in the spine. Lots of, lots of caves in that part of the world. When his brothers, David's brothers, and his father, what's the name of, of David's father? Jesse. Jesse, right? The Messiah came from the root of Jesse, right? Jesse, this David's father, when his brothers, how many brothers does he have? This is like a test day. No, he has seven brothers, doesn't he? Check for me. I go back to 1 Samuel 16, check for me. I think he has seven brothers that Samuel met, but Mike's going to check for me. You know, I'm old. I can't remember all these things that well. I think he has seven brothers, and he's the eighth. So... Um, when his brothers and his father's household heard about it, they went down to him there. All those who were in distress or in debt or discontented gathered around David, and he became the commander. About 400 men were with him. So now he has a real fighting band, much larger than this band. This is, you know, this is, this is David has an inner circle of maybe he develops, not quite yet, but he has, ends up with a, a circle of about 30 fighting men. But he really has a, a pretty good sized army at this point. Because I know we get these numbers in the Bible, you know, where thousands upon thousands upon tens of thousands are going into battle and all that stuff. But as we've talked about, there's a lot of hyperbole in that. That's okay, a lot of hyperbole. 400 men in this world is a pretty good fighting force. And now David's got him. Now, what are they made up of? Are these, are these the cream of Israel's crop? No, no, they're the discontents, right? These are desperate men. They have nowhere to go. He's gathered up around himself the ruffians. He's sort of like, who's he like? He's like Robin Hood. Exactly, kind of like Robin Hood or other people you read stories about in legends and so forth who gather around them a band of men, a band of men who are the outcasts, the ones who are looked down by all the proper folk, men who are hungry, having trouble feeding themselves and their families, and now they have gathered around David. Okay? From there... Because that's why I put the map back up. There's a lot. Of, it's all happening. This is a very small area geographically. Okay? This is, there's no great distance in Bob here. Did you find? How many brothers does he have? Seven. Yay! <laughs> I'm not often to bright, but when I'm right, I will celebrate it. Okay. <laughs> You're about to see. We're going to come up on a passage that's going to illustrate to you that I'm not always right. So I'll take the win right now because I'm about to get thrown for a loss. <laughs> From there, David went to Mizpah in Moab. Now, the um, pastor who did this didn't, didn't put uh, Mizpah on here because Mizpah is over in Moab. Moab is on the other side of the Dead Sea. They are not Israelites. They are not one of the tribes of Israel. The most prominent uh, Moabite is a woman named Ruth. 
And she's prominent simply because we know her story. When Naomi and her husband, Naomi, her husband and sons left Bethlehem, interestingly, and went to Moab because of a drought and famine and that kind of thing. And so that story is related in the book of Ruth. And always remember that Ruth is David's great grandmother. So David's great grandmother is a Moabite. Okay? So from there, David went to Mizpah in Moab and said to the king of Moab, Would you let my father and my mother come and stay with you until I learn what God will do for me? Smart move. Right? He doesn't want Saul to do something to his mother and his father. So he's so concerned about what Saul is going to do that he is going to find refuge for mom and dad to go to and stay safe while Saul is hunting David until this thing is resolved. So he, verse 4, So we left them with the king of Moab, and they stayed with him as long as David was in the stronghold. Okay? But the prophet Gad said to David, Do not stay in the stronghold, go back to the land of Judah. So a prophet named Gad, I don't know anything else about this guy. Except he tells David, you can't hide out here all this time. You have to go back. Right? Which makes sense. Why does that make sense that David just can't run away and hide? Because he is the anointed king of Israel. He is the anointed king of Israel. He must go back. I mean, God had Samuel anoint him for a reason. So he can't just run away and hide somewhere from this. He has to go back. So he left, and he went to the forest of Hereth. So that is up here in the, um, this, it says wilderness on the map. If you go to this part of Israel where the spine is, there are a lot of forests there, a lot of trees um, um, in certain parts, particularly west of like Jerusalem. There's, there's some lovely forests there. So David goes back. He goes back into the same area. He's gone back into the forest. Forests make, what do they provide? They provide good cover. Provide good cover. Right? Shade. What? Shade. Yeah. We like shade. If you've been over there, you like shade. I'm telling you. <coughs> okay. So now we come upon a very serious story. Now Saul heard that David and his men had been discovered. And Saul was seated, spear in hand, under the tamarisk tree on the hill at Gibeah. A tamarisk tree is just a species of tree. It's a big, tall uh, tree with, um, well, it, I should have brought a picture of it, but it's just kind of a, it, it is a tree, but it's kind of a bushy tree, kind of like outside Gloria's. There's a, like a, like a willow tree. You know, a little bit like that, where you have, you have the center part of the tree, but there's an awful lot of stuff hanging off, even down to the ground, if it's not trimmed. And so he's sitting under the tree because he wants the shade, right? With all his officials standing at his side. So he's got the royal court and everything else there with him. All right? Verse 7. Saul said to them, Listen, men of Benjamin. Will the son of Jesse give, you, give all of you fields and vineyards? Will he make all of you commanders of thousands and commanders of hundreds? Is that why you have all conspired against me? No one tells me when my son makes a covenant with the son of Jesse. None of you is concerned about me or tells me that my son has incited my servant to lie and wait for me as he does today. So Saul is going off on all of his royal court. Oh, you've all abandoned me. You won't tell me the truth. You're keeping secrets from me. Everybody here knew that Jonathan and David were, had made this coveted. Nobody's keeping, keeping it. Nobody's telling me, oh, woe is me, oh, woe is me, oh, woe is me. Verse 9. But Doeg the Edomite... 
Don't you wonder what they called them in school? But Doeg, <laughs> the Edomite, who was standing with Saul's officials, so he's in the crowd around Saul, you know, they're all there to suck up and all that kind of stuff. He said, I saw the son of Jesse come to Ahimelech, son of Ah Ahitub, at Nob. Ahimelech Ahimelech inquired of Yahweh for David, meaning on David's <coughs> behalf. Ahimelech the priest, the, one of God's priests, a priest of the Lord we were told back in chapter 21. Ahimelech, he's one of God's priests. It, the beating heart of Judaism at this time and was, um, was the priestly system and the system of sacrifices and atonement and so forth. He says, I saw the son of Jesse. I saw David come to Ahimelech. And Ahimelech inquired of Yahweh on David's behalf. He also gave him provisions. And he even gave him the sword of Goliath the Philistine. <laughs> then the king sent for, you bet, for the priest Ahimelech, son of Ahitub, and all the men of his family. So because the priests are familial, Okay, it's a family. It's a the it's hard to trace the story of the priests. The neat way is, well, Levi, one of the sons of Jacob, his family becomes the priests, and they aren't given land in Israel because they're supposed to be supported by all of the Israelites, but it's not that easy. Okay? So there are a couple of priestly lines, one going back to Zadok, I think. But this is, these are the priests of Israel are, that all live there at Nob because there's no Jerusalem in the picture yet, right? So, the king sent for the priest to Himelech, son of Ahitub, and all the men of his family who were the priests at Nob, and they all came to the king, and Saul said, Listen now, son of Ahitub. And Ahimelech simply says, Yes, my lord. And Saul said to him, you, Why have you conspired against me, you and the son of Jesse? See, Saul won't even say his name. He won't say David's name. He knows what David's name is. The son of Jesse, giving him bread and a sword and going to God in prayer for him, inquiring of God for him so that he has rebelled against me and lies in wait for me as he does today. Ahimelech answered the king, Who of all your servants is as loyal as David? What has David done against Saul? To this, to this point, is there anything that David has done against Saul? No, no. no there isn't. Go back to the spear chucking by Saul. There, David hasn't done anything. He's just been on the run this whole time. Who of all your servants is as loyal as David, the king's son-in-law, captain of your bodyguard, highly respected in your household? He's, he's married to your daughter, Michael. What has he done? Think about it, Saul. What has he done? Because Saul is paranoid of him, right? He's lying in wait for me, Saul said a few verses ago. Lying in wait. He's going to get me. Saul is sinking into paranoia. as he drifts further and further from God. Was that the first time I inquired of God? This is Ahimelech again. Was that the first time when he came to Nob? Was that the first time I inquired of God for him? Of course not. Let not the king accuse your servant or any of his father's family, for your servant knows nothing at all about this whole affair. But the king said, You will surely die, Ahimelech. You and your whole family. Those are, the, those are the words of a mad king. Are they not? Kings had absolute power. Then the king ordered the guards at his side, turn and kill the priests of Yahweh because they too have sided with David. They knew he was fleeing, yet they did not tell me 
But the king's officials were unwilling to raise a hand against the priests. They're not going to strike down the priests of Yahweh. That's crazy. That's crazy. It's blasphemous. These men are... These men are sacred. These men are consecrated to this life. There's a whole consecration ceremony they go through as priests of Yahweh. They're consecrated to this life. They can't strike them down. So the officials get it right. Saul has it completely. He's, he's gone to the darkest place imaginable. The king then ordered Doeg. Doeg, now we know why... Doeg, we're told time and again, is an Edomite. As an Edomite, he's not an Israelite. He doesn't worship Yahweh. Yahweh's not his God. So understand something. This is a time when the Israelites, as they have for a long time before, they don't think there's only one God who created all that is. They just think they have the best God on the block. Yahweh is their God, but they don't think that there aren't others, which gives rise to all the pagan worship and so forth that they go through, you know, in the story, in the story of Israel. It takes them a long time, even when they see it demonstrated to them by Elijah, uh, by God and Elijah. They, it's hard for them to let go of the idea that there's, all bunches of gods and goddesses and that there is only one true God, okay? By Jesus' day, of course, they do. They're radically monotheistic by Jesus' day, but that's not, that's not who these people are. That's why one of the commandments is, you know, don't have any other gods before me. That's not a, that's not a commandment about avoiding, you know, fancy cars and American Express cards and whatever else you might choose to worship. No, it's a don't have any other of these gods and goddesses. So the king's officials, the end of verse 17, the king's officials were unwilling to raise a hand to strike the priests of the Lord. The king then ordered Doeg, you turn and you strike down the priests. So Doeg the Edomite turned and struck them down. That day he killed 85 men who wore what? The linen ephod. An ephod is a, um, it's like, a bit like a tunic. Um, it is a piece of cloth on the front, a piece of cloth on the back that's joined together at the top um, with a couple of ceremonial stones on the, engraved on the stones with the names of the 12 tribes of Israel and it's part of the priestly garment and then they would wear um, a vestment on the top of that and the ephod is this it's it's priestly clothing so the it's the writer is is making sure you understand what happened here that Doeg struck down 85 men who wore the linen ephod these are the priests of Yahweh. Doeg doesn't care that they're the priests of Yahweh. He's just doing what Saul wants him to do. But for Saul to order this, how far away from God is Saul at this point? He's run as far away from, Saul, uh, from God as you can get. He's run as far. Remember I said, yes, we could take this whole, thought, whole Saul thing and express it the way our world would tend to do it today with psychological terms and depression and darkness and mental illness and all that kind of stuff. But if you do that, you lose the spiritual dimension of what has happened that began with Saul's disobedience to God and has now culminated in his killing, Saul's killing, Doeg's just the instrument, his killing of 85 priests of God and that's basically wiping them all out wiping them all out verse 19 
Delweg also put to the sword Nob, the town of the priests, with its men and women, its children and infants, and its cattle, donkeys and sheep. Now, is he doing all this by himself? I, d I doubt it. He's getting assistance from other Edomite. He, Delweg has probably got people with him of his own. So here's what's happened. The whole town is wiped out. Men, women, children, all the priests of Israel. This is a dark, dark day. Dark day. Saul, Saul, there's no coming back from this for Saul. There can't be. How could there be a coming back from this? Verse 20. Here's, here's God's way. But there's one son of Ahimelech, son of Ahitu, named Abiathar. So that's a name to underline. Just as you underline Abner, which is the name that will stay with us, Abiathar is. He is a priest of God, escaped, and he fled to join David. So now David has a priest with him who escaped from the massacre in Gibeah and at Nob. And then he told, verse 21, he told David that Saul had killed the priests of Yahweh. Then David said to Abiathar, that day when Doeg the Edomite was there, I knew he would be sure to tell Saul. I'm responsible for the death of your whole family. It's like he sensed he, he had a terrible feeling that day that something was going to, bad was going to come, that Doeg was there as Saul's and something terrible would come from it and David didn't act, which means basically he let Doeg leave alive. And now he feels responsible because Doeg went back and he told Saul and then Saul issues this order and there's this enormous massacre. But David says to Abiathar, stay with me, don't be afraid. The man who wants to kill you is trying to kill me too. You will be safe with me. David's got 400 men. David's a smart guy. They know how to fight. He knows where to hide. He takes Abiathar in, and now David has a priest with him. One of the things that distinguished Israel from its neighbors when they had human kings was that the king was not a priestly office. In most empires, in most civilizations, the king was also the high priest. For example, in Rome. In Rome, Caesar was also the Pontifex Maximus, the high priest of Rome, but not for the Israelites. For the Israelites, when they demanded kings, they had a king, and then there were the priests. When you come to the story of Jesus, you have Herod, or later Herod, some, but you, all the time, you have the line of the priests, like Caiaphas, right? Who was the high priest at the time of Jesus, and Anna, Anna, who is his father. So David now has this band of 400 men, fighters, fighters every one of them. The priest Abiathar is with him. So Abiathar can inquire of God, Right on David's behalf, that's the way they understood it, that the priest had a connection with God, which people didn't. This is all pre-Jesus, right? What happens when Jesus is crucified? What's the first thing that happens in Mark's gospel when Jesus is crucified and dies? The curtain in the temple is torn in two, signifying that the, the, the separation between God and humans has been erased. And so we can approach God on our own. That wasn't the way these people tended to see it. So Ahimelech would inquire of God for David. Okay? But you'll see that, you know, David kind of does his own thing too. So any questions about all that? That's, chapter 22 is kind of a big, kind of a big moment. 
Did he kill the king? Um, what do you mean? Ahimelech is a priest. You're thinking of Achish, the king of Gath, the Philistine king. Okay. Ahimelech's the priest. So what saw the people Saul orders dead are Ahimelech and all the other priests. Okay. He basically okay. tries to wipe out an entire priestly line. These are God's priests, okay? So the case, Saul's fine. Well, not fine. He's physically alive, but he could not be in a... He could not be further, further from God than he is now. Ahimelech was a priest. Ahimelech was a priest. Right. And he has now been killed. And the only priest who escapes is this one called Abiathar. So I, the names take getting used to, don't they? Yeah. Really. That's why it's kind of refreshing to run, on, run into Abner. You know? <laughs> I don't think he was a little... But yeah, the name Abner I've run into before. Ahimelech, Abiathar, Doeg, and the rest of them. No, you know, yeah. <laughs> Patty's noting that the population, that there had to be a good number of people in the village of Nob because. There were 85 priests. They would have others who were there with them and children and women and even the livestock, infants, everything. It is, you know, what does, what does the writer, what is the writer trying to convey to us? That there's really, really nothing worse that Saul could do than this. This is no ordinary town that Saul has wiped out. It is the village, the town of the priests, and the whole line, and their families, and their sons, and their daughters. They're all gone, except for Abiathar, who escaped. Yes, I saw a hand back here. Could it be that Saul thought he was above God? Well, okay, good question. So, what is, the, what is the sin committed in the Garden of Eden? They wanted to know what God knows. They thought they knew better. You know, God called them, called, told them don't, but they think they know better. It's going to be all right. They believe the serpent. It's going to be good. It's going to be all right. Sure, go ahead. Eat the fruit. Right? And everything terrible that flows from that. So, in our world today, do we not, do we not live in a world which is increasingly putting us at the center of everything, above everything else, that we think human reason, our ability to think, can is at the center and the top of all that is? I think we do. We live in a time which has increasingly brought itself to that point. And I think we are reaping the whirlwind from that. Yes. So Jane's telling us sort of a parable, really, about yeah. electrical generators. You have two of them that work in tandem. And if you think about them like faith and science, then they can. But what's happened is we've taken the two and we've, last in the 19th century, sent them off into different wings of a big house. And now much of the world is ignoring the faith side, only paying attention to the science side. And that is, where is that taking us? You know? I, a, there you go, AI. You know, how are we going to do with AI, really? As, are we going to screw it up? 
you know, we probably will. Well, it'll screw us up because we've screwed up rather than, and, you know, so, okay, so what's the fundamental problem that humanity has? Is it a lack of education? No. No. Is it a lack of resources? No. No. What is it? No, we're not evil, but it is the fact that there's a darkness in the human heart. Our hearts are given over to sin. I say we're not evil because we're made in the image of God. So, so I, I really, I, I don't like, I don't like to go there. E, e, evil, evil is an act. It is an act which diminishes the good. Do we commit evil acts? Yes. Do some people commit the most heinous, unimaginable evil acts? Yes. Are those people, were those people still made in the image of God? Yes. Okay. So, but we have this darkness in the human heart. Um, you remember from high, well, maybe, I don't know what people read in high school. Um, but remember Joseph Conrad, a yes. long time ago, wrote a novel called The Heart of Darkness? Right? So that title alone expresses the biblical under it's what is it? it? It's theological anthropology. A key tenet of key theological anthropology is that there is something wrong with us which we cannot fix. And that if you pretend it away, it will devour you. Genesis 4. What happens when Cain gets angry with his brother? What does how, how does scripture express it? God comes to Cain and says, look, there's a monster. There's a monster and it's going to devour you. And it does and Cain kills his brother. And ignoring that monster, pretending that monster away is just foolishness. There was a writer. Ah! Anyway, I can't remember her name right now. It's just gone. It's off my, you know, it's so funny on Sunday morning. Some of you might have been there. I made a reference to a Rolodex. <laughs> little John, not little anymore. 17-year-old Jonathan Wolf raised his hand. And said, I said, oh, Jonathan, what? He goes, what's a Rolodex? <laughs> I cracked up. That was one of the best questions ever. So, yeah, but, yeah, but anyway, so sometimes I, I, I can't pull that stuff up as fast as I once did. But she wrote, she wrote famously, um, mainly short stories, and she wrote with what she called Christian realism about the world. She said, we don't look at the world through rose-colored glasses. We shouldn't. We understand. We Christians should understand who we are in a way that other people might not. So anyway, yes. 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 What, what you observe is that Saul, the Saul's officials who won't kill the priests right. seem to stand aside while Doeg does it. Right. Yeah. yeah, well, I it's think that's probably fair enough. Yeah, there's no answer for it, but it's just well, I, th- I think... I think, one, they didn't actually do it. Secondly, it is true that they live in a world in which life is very cheap. That's not the world we live in, right? We live in a world in which, well, life is getting cheap. We need to hang on to that lesson, too. Life, you know, we're, we, we talk out both sides of our mouths. But um, certainly in a world in which, in the world of what? Conan the Barbarian. In Jesus' day, people went to arenas to watch other people kill each other and the blood flow and the dirt get caked with blood and stuff. So, yeah, but they did. They just stand aside. So how do the officials come out in this story? Pretty Not pretty bad. Mm-hmm. They could have they, they intervened, I guess. They should have intervened. should have intervened, but they don't. They're Saul. Saul is king. They're just not willing to carry out his bidding here. So they don't come out like heroes, do they? No, they don't. 
Yes, Patty. Okay, so I want to go back to we're all created in the image of God. But now at this point, Saul, we know he's losing his mind, but he was a man of God. He did believe in God. He was, a, he was anointed as the king. He's, his, when he looks in the mirror, if you could actually see, you know what I'm saying? The yes. Resembling God in God's image, it's, it's now so tarnished. And yes. Like Is there anything? What? What's his name? The other guy? Doeg. Doeg. Oh my gosh. Well, he wasn't. He was never a person. He's okay. never an Israelite that we know of, but he presumably. Was still born in the image of God. Created in the image created of God. Image of yes. God. Which? Yes. So we all are created, but based on what we decide to do, how much we reject God, that image can keep. Tarnishing and tarnishing till there's nothing left. That's the question. Okay. Can can you can you do things which so diminish the image of God in you that it is simply gone? And in that case, what are you? Are you even human anymore? So um, N.T. Wright has written about this. He says he thinks of it as each of us having the image of God. This is just a metaphor, okay? That it's like the image of God in us is like a golden statue. When I always think of an Oscar, you know, the little Oscar statues and stuff. And he says, we're created in the image of God and this, this golden statue. And what happens over the course of our life because of all the ways that we fail to love God and fail to love others, small, large, we chip away at it. And it gets tarnished and it gets smaller and it gets beaten up. And so he po has posed the question, could you actually actually do so much to the image of God in you that it's simply gone? And his question is, then what would you become? Because he says, look, for him, the image of God is what makes us human. The image of God in us is what makes us not, not the chimps who are who have a brain, they're, they're pretty intelligent, right? It's the image of God that sets us apart from the image of creatures. And if the image of God is gone in a person, then what are they? And he says, well, they would just be a brute. He doesn't think a person could actually do anything, not even Saul here, that would actually completely eliminate within them the image of God. And I think as the way we Christians will express it sometimes is, can you do something which would forever put you beyond the reach of God's grace? And the answer is no. That's the scandal of grace, that God is always reaching out. Um, <coughs> so um, I don't think even for Saul, these terrible acts they've done. Hey, what, it, it, it's kind of like, what, what is it like? If, if God's the solar system, Saul has run so far, he's now sitting on that tiny little rock that used to be called a planet, that's Pluto, right? That's kind of like where he is now. Could he, could he sink further? I guess we'll find out, right? Yes. But God's always saying that if we don't, if we don't seek redemption, we don't, yes, we're created in God's image, but we have to be the one to seek redemption when we've done something that we, or done many things that. Okay, so, so Sharon is saying that we are made in the image of God and we need to seek redemption. Okay, so let me ask you though. See, because that's kind of that's kind of a standard way we often talk about it. I often talk about it that way. When Jesus goes in the parable, when Jesus goes, the man goes searching for the lost sheep. It, does the sheep find the man, or does the, does the man find Jesus? <laughs> Wait, <laughs> <laughs> could I mess that up anymore? This is, the parable is only like three verses long. How could I, okay. 
<laughs> does the man find the, the sheep or does the sheep find the man? Amen. Man finds the sheep. I think what we experience as finding Jesus is Jesus is us no longer turning away. That Jesus finds us. It is Jesus who must find us because we are in the darkness. And what I experience as a desire to seek redemption is me not running so fast away from God. How about that? You think that could be a way to talk about it? Right? So... But wasn't he always right there? Jesus is always right there. God's always right there. The question is, do we, how far away do we go? When I, when I feel like I've, you know, God has left me, ha has God really gone somewhere? No, I've just... I've, I'm the one who's gone somewhere. Right? And what I have to do is come back. I was one time at a laity week event down at SMU taught, and it was a, took a course taught by Arthur's dad. I didn't know Arthur at the time. I didn't know Scott Jones at the time, but Scott was on the faculty at SMU at the time. So he had taught this course. And so I wanted particularly with help explaining things to people. And so I asked him about grace, you know? Because grace is not something that we give to God. It's something that God pours out on us. Those are words we use all the time. So he said, um, he said, well, okay. So we're kind of like teenagers that go running through the house. Whoosh, 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 and all the time, mom or dad is standing there. I love you. I love you. I love you. And they're out the door. <laughs> Until finally they come running and running past and God grabs them and they stop. And they turn and they hear, I love you, I love you. And I always kind of like that because I think I, God's a speak for me. I've always had this tendency to want to take, put this in the terms of what I do, what I must do. And the, the, the problem with that is it, it can make one feel a little better or a little superior than maybe a brother or a sister who haven't done that, right? So I, I've really tried to, to kind of switch, switch it for me and saying, look, it's God who grabbed me. I did not grab God. Patty was an integral part of a big change in my life, but it's God who grabbed me. I didn't grab God. I just, in, in some of my dark times, I just wasn't, I just wasn't turned away. I just wasn't running away because God's always there. God's always reaching out. God's always you know, reaching out for us as we go flying by too busy with all that other stuff in our life. So this is why we as Christians have multiple ways we talk about all of this, don't we? Really, truthfully, we talk about what God does and God pours out his grace on us. And then we talk about what we experience or what we do. And it's, whew. yeah, it's not all left brained. If I have that right. Okay, anything else? Scott, yes, Patty. Flannery O'Connor, thank you online people. Yes, that's the name, Flannery O'Connor. Pick. She's got a famous book of short stories. She does. Ask somebody online what the, her, her they can hear me, Patty. Yeah. So <laughs> 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 you don't have to type it. Yeah, so like what she ha she she sort of burst onto the scene with 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 a collection of short stories. She had, she wrote a few novels um uh Wise Wise Blood, I think is one. Um but she, this collection of short stories and and uh, she was a Catholic person, Roman Catholic and she wrote from a Christian perspective. She called it Christian realism about the world. One of the things that bugs me about the world we live in is everybody thinks if you want to read something 
Christian, you've got to go to a bookstore and look on the Christian shelves, you know? Well, that's not true. Probably the greatest Christian novel of all time is The Brothers Karamazov by Dostoevsky. More theology and thought about God in that novel than pretty much anywhere else. Dostoevsky was a big, big contemplator of God and the things of God, and it's what populates his, his novels, or Crime and Punishment, there's another one, filled with, filled with um, theology and stuff. So anyway, yes, Flannery O'Connor. I've got to get out away from there. I get you to hear you, Jane. Yes, what Jane's pointing out is that the, the Russian literature is, is, is filled with the contemplation of God and wrestling through the questions, and yet the Russians have turned away, right? And even though they might lift up the, the Tolstoy and Dostoevsky and these great Russian novelists, they've basically turned their back on all of that. Yep, absolutely. I think it's, yes, it's called A Good Man is Hard to Find. <laughs> that was the name that was the that was one of the short stories and I think was the name for the collection that was published in the mid 50s as I recall since I couldn't even remember the poor woman's name she died at 39 Jack Benny was 39 for 40 years <laughs> I remember I, I always liked the show Jack Benny when I was a kid you know it, it, it struck a chord with me and I but I remember thinking to myself, if you're going to lie about your age, why would you pick such an old age <laughs> like 39? <laughs> oh, man. Here we are. Book of Samuel, Jack Benny, alongside Flannery O'Connor. Okay. Well, so Saul has murdered the priests of Nob, and that's how you should see it. Yes, I know Doeg. Doeg's instrument, it is, the, the focus is on Saul. And I know Saul's officials could have intervened and did, but the focus is on Saul. This is the story of Saul and David. When David was, ver, tap, uh, chapter 23, verse 1. When David was told, look, the Philistines are fighting against Keilah. That's how you pronounce it, I looked it up. Keilah and are looting the threshing floors and were stealing their crops. So um, Keilah, remember Dave was at the caves of Adullam? Here's Keilah, it's all in the same area. He inquired of Yahweh, David asks God, shall I go and attack these Philistines? And Yahweh answered him, Go attack the Philistines and save Keilah. So he basically asks God a yes or no question, and the answer he gets is yes. Okay? What is happening there and how it comes to be that David hears God seemingly so clearly, I don't know. We're not told. We'll maybe get a hint a little bit, a little bit later. Verse 3, but David's men said to him, here in Judah, we are afraid. His, you know, they're, they're trying to hide from Saul and the army of Israel. How much more then if we go to Keilah against the Philistine forces? Like, David, what are you pulling us into this for? You know, we're, we're basically hiding from Saul. What are, why are we going to take on a fight against the Philistines right now? So once again, David inquired of Yahweh, and Yahweh answered him, Go down to Keilah, for I am going to give the Philistines into your hand. So David basically went to God and said, Are you sure? <laughs> and God says, Yes, I'm sure. So David and his men went to Keilah. They fought the Philistines and carried off, the lives, off their livestock. He inflicted heavy losses on the Philistines and saved 
the people of Keilah. Okay, now, parens. is got a parens there because the translators say this is a little aside to just a little piece of information that the writer is giving you, kind of out of the flow of the narrative. Now, Abiathar, son of Ahimelech, had brought the ephod down with him when he fled to David at Keilah. So this priestly garment that is the signifier and, you know, of, of Abiathar's priestly status, he has with him this ephod. Well, verse 7. Saul was told that David had gone to Keilah, and he said, God has delivered him into my hands, for David has imprisoned himself by entering a town with gates and bars. Okay. Every town that was worthy of being a town had around it walls, gates, and bars. It was the only way to keep out the loads and loads of bad guys. So... David has now entered a town that has gates and bars, which means what? He's on the inside. He could be trapped there. If Saul can move fast enough, he can trap David there. He's imprisoned himself. And so Saul got up and he called all his forces for battle to go down to Keilah to besiege David and his men. They're going to go down, do the standard ancient warfare thing. They're going to surround the city until they come out. Until they starve him out. Yes, Gary? What do you think the population is? Of Keilah? Yeah. Not big. No populations are big. I would call it a thousand people. I don't know. He's in, none of the populations are large. There's just, you know, call it 2,000 people. But it's not like, I mean, in Jesus' day, the Jerusalem, the population of Jerusalem accepted festivals was maybe 40,000, 50,000 you know, yeah. good size, but not. Well, you had to have a wall. Yeah. You know, you had to have a wall. And then people in the surrounding area, in times of trouble, when, you know, some marauders or something were coming, they would come inside the gates and they close them. That went on for thousands of years, right? Until the time of artillery and such. Verse 9. When David learned that Saul was plotting against him, in other words, on his way, he said to Abiathar the priest, Bring the ephod. David said, Lord, Yahweh, God of Israel, your servant has heard definitely that Saul plans to come to Keilah and destroy the town on account of me. Will the citizens of Keilah surrender me to him? Will Saul come down as your servant has heard? Yahweh, God of Israel, tell your servant. And Yahweh said, he will. Yes. So what is the significance of David having the ephod? Y'all know what divination is. Divination. We use the word divining things some once in a while, but divination is an ancient practice of of appealing to God for direction and having something that you do to facilitate that. So, for example, in the book of Acts, chapter 1, we learn that Judas has killed himself. Thus, the number of the 12, of a capital T, is now the capital E, 11. That's not good. So they know they need to add another one to the 11 to get back to the 12 because Jesus has formed himself around himself a new Israel. So they, they want to get the 12th. So the way they get the 12th is they have a couple of candidates and they draw lots. They have two candidates, Matthias and some other person whose name is there, but I can't remember. It's kind of lost to history, you know. So, um, and Matthias draws the lot, the winning lot. It's like flipping a coin. Why do they flip a coin over something so important? Because they believe that God will make the flip come out the way God wants the flip to come out. So, 
it's debated the degree to which the ancient Israelites practiced divination. Because on the one hand, they are explicitly instructed not to in the law of Moses. But on the other hand, they appear to have done just that. And the classic example is David and this ephod. Now what's he doing with the ephod? We could only guess. We're never told what he's doing with the ephod. But clearly it's brought into this because he, he certainly seems to be using the ephod in the, his inquiring of God. Is he wearing the ephod? Probably not. Why not? He's not a priest. There are stones up here that join the front to the back of the ephod that have the, the name. Might he be using those stones in some way? Um, turning them, looking at them, rolling them. I don't know. We don't know. But it seems to be what's happening here. Because notice all of his questions are what? They're, they, they're all yes, no questions. They're not, these, this is, he doesn't need a paragraph from God. All he wants is thumbs up, thumbs down. Thumbs up, thumbs down. So, at the end of verse 11, and Yahweh said, yes, he will, yes. And again, David asked, will the citizens of Kalah surrender me and my men to Saul? And Yahweh said, yes. Oh, no. <laughs> of course they will. I mean, you know, they, they don't mind protecting David, but Saul is on his way, and they, heard, they would have probably heard by now of what happened to the people of Nob. They don't want to end up like the, what would they be, Nobites? Nabinians? I don't know. The people of Nob. What? Knobbers? <laughs> Thanks, Don. The knobbers, yes. Well, the citizens of Keilah surrender me and my men to Saul, and the Lord said they will. So David and his men, about 600 in number now. So he is still gathering strength. People are still coming to him. Him, David, who killed the tens of thousands. David. Join David. He'll take care of you. He'll see that you're safe. We're going to band together. We got nothing here. We're, Saul's after us. You got nothing. Come on. Come on. Join us. You're desperate. You're outlaws. So David and his men, about 600 in number, left Keila Ke and kept moving from place to place. They're here. They're there. They're there. They're here. When Saul was told that David had escaped from Keila, he didn't go there. So David does not stay in the town. He leaves the town, and they start going from place to place to place to place. So what does David do then? He stayed in the wilderness strongholds and in the hills of the desert of Ziph. Do they put Ziph on here? Yeah. Again, it's all, you know, these guys are all on foot. How far are they going to go? Really? Day after day, Saul searched for him, but God did not give David into his hands. So lest you think that God is asleep through this whole thing, God is not asleep through this whole thing. God is with David. David is God's anointed. Saul has run away from God as fast as Saul can, has even killed the priests of God. So God has not given um, David into Saul's hands. So that's where we're going to leave it. When we come back up there, we are going to, well, you're going to see where I was wrong. Okay, that'll be fun. <laughs> Okay, and um, we will come to, well, one of my favorite stories, one of, a place that we have visited several times on trips to Israel called En Gedi, and um, 
it's it's a it was it's a story that I've always enjoyed preaching on when I had the chance to do so. So anyway, so any final reflections or observations or thoughts or questions? It's a little bit, yes, it, is, it bears resemblances to Robin Hood, right? Right, the sheriff of Nottingham is Saul, and you're right. And David and his men are living out there in the forest. He's probably got some fat, jolly guy he calls Little John. <laughs> yes. Yes. So, so what's being brought up is that the, the army would, you know, these men, they would go from place to place. They, they had to be supported somehow and fed somehow, and maybe the ta- little populations of these towns and villages would support them for a while, and then they had to move on. So they went from place to place. Good point. Looking for food. What? An army runs on its stomach, right? Right. Okay, so very good. So let's pray. You have anything else, Patty? No. Okay. The only thing I was thinking of, I think we probably all had one of those eight balls when we were little. Like you could only ask the yes and no questions. To <laughs> yes. <laughs> and it would always come up, the answer is not clear at this time. <laughs> yes, you'd ask the little eight ball, right? What, what was going on, the magic eight ball? And that reminds me of a story of Saul that still lies ahead. Stay tuned. Stay tuned. I feel a little bit like the way this is, it's a little bit like when I was a kid, we'd go to the Rex Theater in Shreveport, and you go to a movie, you know, something like, you know, Frankenstein's face or something, and they would have one of those old serials, like Buck Rogers or some other one that would run, and then next time, Come back next, bring your quarterback next Saturday. Yeah, a little bit. Except more momentous probably, I should say. So anyway, pray with me. Gracious Lord. Help us to hear in these stories that indeed you are at the center of all things. And Saul has run from you as far as he possibly can. And bringing him into a deeper and deeper and deeper and more horrifying more horrifying darkness we pray lord that you will pour out your great grace on us such that we can stay that we will stay close to you that if we begin to think that you have gone somewhere you haven't that we are the ones who have gone somewhere for learning to trust you and rely on you and see you as the sure shield in our lives. That is part of what it means to grow in our discipleship. And we so desire that. All this we pray in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen.